Welcome to Last Asset News. Today, instead of talking about the news, I want to share with you um, a piece that talks about exactly what happened with Three Arrows Capital. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because I don't want anybody to, to mismanage or forget exactly what happened here. I think as time moves on, it's important that we go through exactly what happened that really brought down uh, the entire crypto market uh, from a high of over three trillion down to a trillion. Today it is uh, August 2022, and we're going to go over exactly what happened with Three Arrows Capital. And I got to tell you, after going through this multiple times, these stories, it makes a lot of sense as to why big um, capital fell victim to what happened here with Three Arrows Capital, like a Celsius, like a Voyager. Not making excuses, but I see exactly what happened. So, first, before we get started. Let me uh, make mention of this, and this is important. We don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. It's the same kind of thing that uh, Warren Buffett would say. Uh, you have to learn from mistakes. They don't have to be your mistakes, but you still have to reflect on the mistakes and think about exactly what happened. And as time moves forward, there's going to be people who are just going to hear about Three Arrows Capital and not going to know exactly how big this story was and how fast the entire market can circle the drain on the actions of just one or two people. So to get into this, there was a, a great story and it started off, it's on uh, NY Mag, and it was a pretty big expose into the history of Three Arrows Capital. This is Zoo and Davies, the, the two gentlemen who were uh, responsible for Three Arrows Capital, and this is their story. So instead of being like the news, this is gonna be more like uh, a deep dive into just what the heck went wrong. So. These are, as the stats that clearly states, the crypto geniuses who vaporized a trillion dollars quite easily, as a matter of fact. And the first part here is not to give us much history, but just to give us context as to where we're, we're coming from. The boat was a beauty, some 500 tons across 171 feet. 171 feet of glass and steel as wide as Santorini. All rounded edges, five decks with one with a glass bottom pool were made for July. On the Mediterranean, sunset dinners among the islands near Sicily, cocktails in the turquoise shallows off the coast of Ibiza. The would-be captain showed off pictures of the 50 million vessel at parties, bragging that it would be bigger than any of the billionaires' yachts in Singapore, and describing plans to adore the stateroom with projector screens and a bunch of other stuffs as far as like digital art in the form of NFTs. And that's just to tell you how far ahead these two guys were. Suzu and Kyle Davies, Three Arrows Capital, never got the chance to spray champagne across Much Wow's bow. That was the name, apparently, of the yacht that it was being bought. Much Wow, pretty much of a reference to Dogecoin. In July, the same month the boat was set to launch, the duo filed for bankruptcy and disappeared before making their final payment marooning the unclaimed trophy in the berth at La Spezia on the Italian coast. So they paid off the $150 million, just let it sit there, just because they could. Crypto companies from New York to Singapore were direct victims of Three Arrows. Voyager Digital, a publicly traded crypto exchange based in New York that once had a multi-billion dollar valuation filed for Chapter 11 in July, reporting that Three Arrows owed it more than $650 million. Genesis Global Trading, headquartered in, in Park Avenue, had lent three hours at $2.3 billion. Blockchain.com, an early crypto company, provide digital wallets. Uh, they lent them $270 million in unpaid loans from 3AC and has laid off a quarter of its staff because it can never get these back. And then just to bring things into context, we're actually right now uh, going through Chapter 11 with uh, Voyager Digital. So they're going through it. Celsius is going through the same thing. And we can take a look at it right here we can see this is the financial snapshot. This is just in June. I don't know where this is going. It'll be an interesting uh, case study as time moves on. But you can see right here the financial snapshot. If we blow this up a little bit, this is as of June 30th. And this is in millions of dollars. So the total cash they have on hand is 104 million. Total crypto loaned, loaned it states here 470 million, which is a little different because over here it said it was 650 million. Maybe they paid some back. Total crypto held and loaned is $1.26 or $1,260,000,000. And it states here total recoverable assets are 1.260. So 
if all the total crypto loan is going to 3AC, I don't think that's recoverable, but it remains to be seen. So the total unsecured claims, this is estimated customer claims and other unsecured claims, because I don't know, is $1.8 billion. So if we take 1.8 minus 1.2, looks like a pretty good stage. However, I don't think that that 470 million is there. I think it's actually the total crypto held is 685 million plus 104. You're looking at 789 million minus 1.8. Now, we'll see what happens. But as we get into this story, you can see how uh, the chances could be potentially quite slim. So moving on. Three arrows is meaningfully responsible for the larger crypto cash of 2022. And um, if you're watching this in 2024 or 2025 or I don't know, 2023 when there's a the next bull run, I don't know when it's gonna be, but just remember this on the next bull run because it's important that you know this. Sam Bakeman fried said, I suspect they might be 80% of the total original contagion, which means like if it wasn't for 3AC and Luna uh, for one, one way, we wouldn't, we may be still in this, in a bull run and who knows. For a firm that always portrayed itself as playing just with its own money, where they state, we don't have any external investors, 3AC CEO had told Bloomberg as recently as February, by mid-July, creditors had come forward more than 2.8 billion in claims. So at first they said, hey, we don't use anything but our own money. And that was in February. Then in July, they had 2.8 billion in outstanding claims. Interesting. So somebody was lying. Everyone in crypto from the largest lenders to wealthy investors seem to have lent 3AC their digital coins. That money appears to be gone. The true scale of losses may never be known for many of the crypto startups that parked their money with the firm disclosing that relationship publicly is to risk increased scrutiny from both their investors and government regulators. So again, I don't think this is over by any stretch of the imagination. I think there's a lot of people out there who are owed a lot of money that but will never say that it's 3ACs until they collapse. And then they'll say, well, this is the reason why. So that is just one thing that could potentially happen. Moving down, a little history. Sue Zhu and, and uh, Kyle Davies met at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. They went to college together at Columbia, where they both took a math-heavy course load. Zhu graduated early year, summa cum laude, moved to Tokyo to trade derivatives at Credit Suisse, where Davies followed him as an intern. And it's important to know the history, because you don't know where you're going until you know where somebody's been. They had desks next to each other until Zoo was laid off in the financial crisis, landing at a high-frequency trading shop in Singapore called Flow Traders. Zoo learned the art of arbitrage, capturing small variations in value between two assets, selling one that's overpriced and buying one that's underpriced. He focused on ETFs. He excelled at it, rising to the top percentile of money makers at Flow. And after Flow, they left. Zoo did a stint at Deutsche Bank. Davies had stayed on the on a credit Swiss. By then, both were tired of the big bank life. Zoo complained to acquaintances about the low caliber of his banking colleagues and a bloated culture that allowed people to lose the firm's money on a trade with little consequence. And I just left that in there. Not that it was important to know about these gentlemen, but it's important to know about banks in general. So just know that the people that are looking out for you and your money Nobody's looking out for you and your money harder than you are. So just remember that. You're smart enough to understand these things. In 2012, they both pooled their savings and borrowed money from their parents to scrape together about a million in seed funds for Three Arrows Capital. In less than two months, they had doubled their money. The pair went to Singapore because it had no capital gains tax. By 2013, they registered their fund with plans to relinquish their U.S. passports and become citizens. So it was very well set up in Singapore by 2013. During the early phase... Three Arrows Capital focused on a niche market, arbitrage, emerging market foreign exchange or FX derivatives, uh, financial products uh, like the Thai bot or the Indonesian rupiah, for instance, where they would go back and forth. At the time, FX trading was moving to electronic platforms. And that's amazing. In, in uh, such a, not too long ago, in 20, 2015, when this was happening. At the time, 2015, FX trading was moving to electronic platforms. And it was easy to find differences or spreads between the prices quoted to different banks. Three Arrows found its sweet spot, trolling the listings for mispricings and picking them off, often pocketing just fractions of a cent on each dollar traded. And it was a strategy that the banks detested. And there's a reason that they detested it so much because they could have actually pocketed that money and they didn't because these two guys were playing arbitrage. By 2017, and this is an important date to remember this, by 2017, 
the bank started cutting them all off. Whenever Three Arrows requested a price, all the bank FX traders were like, F these guys, I'm not gonna price them. Lately, a joke has been going around among FX traders who knew Three Arrows in its early days and watched it class with a bit of Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. German for just a little bit of happiness at someone else's despair. We FX traders are probably to blame for this because we knew for a fact that these guys were not able to make money in FX. But then when they came to crypto, everyone thought they were geniuses. And that's the problem. And just remember this in the next bull run. The people that become the next geniuses in the next bull run, it's not hard to be a genius in a bull run. Everybody is. Look for the ones that have been around for quite some time that have actually done well in the bear markets. That's the biggest bellwether you can find of success. So that date, remember 2017 is when they got started to get kicked off by the banks. <clears throat> in late 2017, crypto crashed to $3,000. Three arrows switched its focus to crypto, starting to invest at such an opportune time that Zoo was often credited, which is to say he took credit for calling the bottom. In later years, it looked like brilliance to many impressionable crypto noobs and even industry in insiders. Timing may have, may have been just bad luck or been luck. After all, Three Arrows was looking for a new racket. So for you who are watching this later on, just remember, just because someone says they, they call the top, they call the bottom, does not mean that they are a genius or that they know any, something that anybody else knows. Sometimes people just get lucky. And all he had to do is call the top enough and you say, you know what? The top's in April. Maybe, no, no, top's in May. No, no, top's in September. No, no, top's in November. Oh, see, I told you, top was in November. It doesn't matter. Just take a look at who does well in these bear markets and what makes sense to you. So to continue on, finish this up. With crypto trading on exchanges around the world, the firm's experience with arbitrage came in handy. One famous trading strategy was known as the kimchi premium. It involved buying Bitcoin in the US or China and selling at a higher price in South Korea where the exchanges were more tightly regulated, resulting in higher prices. I believe the Sam Bakeman fried did a lot of that. He was into arbitrage and selling between different exchanges and making quite a profit. Uh, at the time, winning trade setups like this were plentiful and profitable. 3AC told investors it practiced low risk strategies designed to make money in both bullish and bearish times. So if you think about that, it wasn't rocket science. All they did was just find prices that were lower and then they would sell it off to places that prices were higher. You can do that in, in a bear or a bull market. So it doesn't take a lot of brain power, just takes a lot of effort or even minimal effort. Another crypto arbitrage might involve buying Bitcoin at its current or spot price while selling Bitcoin futures or vice versa. In order to harvest the price premium, 3AC began borrowing money and putting it to work. And this is where we call leverage. If it all went well, it could generate profits that more than covered the interest it owed in the loan. Then it would do it all over again, continue to grow its pool of investments, which would allow it to borrow even larger sums. And they kept doing that at mass. Beyond heavy borrowing, the firm's growth strategy depended on another scheme, building lots of social media clout. In crypto, the only social media platform is Twitter, crypto Twitter. And uh, I like to peruse that every so often. It is a little toxic, but entertaining. But uh, if you can't stomach it, please don't, <laughs> please don't go to it. Zoo and Davies earned his way into the elite upper tier of crypto Twitter. According to friends, Zoo had a conscious plan to become a Twitter celebrity. It entailed tweeting a lot, pandering to the crypto masses with outrageously bullish prognostications, racking up a huge number of followers and uh, becoming an apex predator on crypto Twitter, profiting the expense of everyone else. I want to read that one more time. Tweeting a lot, pandering to the masses by saying that there's going to be massive bullish movement. Think about the people that you hear and see that are always bullish 24-7, 365, regardless of the reality that they're in. Zhu gained his 570,000 strong following in part by promoting his theory of a crypto super cycle. The idea of a years long bull market for Bitcoin with prices rising well into millions of dollars per coin. And Zhu tweeted, actually tweeted this, let me show you. He would tweet like this. This is back in October 26, 2021, not too long ago for us. I don't know when you're watching this. And Zhu says, as the super cycle continues, but sore mainstream media will try to talk about how the early whales own everything. The richest people in crypto now had near zero net worth in 2019. I know people who unironically say if someone had lent them 50K more, they'd have 500 million more now. And that is quite 
enticing. Zoo hammered the point constantly on the platform and in, in his appearances on crypto podcasts. And he would say, bye, bye, bye. And the super cycle will make you insanely rich someday. They used to boast that they can borrow as much money as they want. This was all planned from the way they established credibility all the way the fund was structured. And I have to tell you, if, if there wasn't for a collapse of Luna and some other issues, I think this could have gone on for quite some time. I think they could have kept borrowing money and making a lot of arbitrage opportunities or buying along these different DeFi and derivatives. I think they could have done quite well. But again, when the bear market comes, we start to see who's swimming naked. And that is what happened here. Even though the, therm, the firm was thriving during the pandemic, the Federal Reserve pumped money into the economy and the U.S. government sent out stimulus checks. Crypto markets rose for months on end. By late 2020, Bitcoin was up fivefold. To many, it looked like a super cycle. Three Arrows main fund posted a return of more than 5,900%. By the end of the year, it was overseeing $2.6 billion in assets and $1.9 billion in liabilities. A pretty good company. One of 3AC's largest position was the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. And the firm accumulated as much as $2 billion in GBTC. At the time, it was trading at a premium to regular Bitcoin because it wasn't Bitcoin. It was paper Bitcoin. And 3AC was happy to pocket the difference. On Twitter, Zoo regularly blasted out bullish appraisals of, of GBTC at various points, observing it was savvy or smart to be buying it, which a lot of people were doing that because they were banking on the fact that it could actually become a spot ETF, and it didn't. Zoo and Davies' public persona became even more extreme. Their tweets were increasingly pompous, and social acquaintances say they didn't bother to hide their condescension toward friends from the past and wealth, less wealthy contemporaries. And again, when you're seeing people on this crypto Twitter or different places that look down on people or they say have fun being poor or stuff like that, that's just when hubris gets way, way too far in the way and a crash is coming at some point. It's called karma and it really does suck, but it's what has to happen. Three hours continue to be a giant funnel for a borrowed capital. A lending boom had taken hold of the crypto industry as DeFi products offer depositors much higher interest rates than they could get at traditional banks. Three Arrows would, through its borrowing desk, take custody of crypto that belonged to employees, friends, and other rich individuals. When lenders asked Three Arrows to put up collateral, it would just push back. Instead, it offered to pay an interest rate of 10% or more, higher than any competitor was delivering, because of its gold standard reputation, as one trader put it. Some lenders didn't even ask for audited financial statements or any documents at all. So this is where I'm gonna jump back and just say, I understand now where like a Voyager or a Celsius or a Vault or all these different places, they might think to themselves, okay, these guys are pretty good. They're managing a multi-billion assets under management. They've been doing this for a while. They were derivative traders. They know what they're doing. We can see it. It looks good. Let's go forward. We need some collateral. You don't need collateral. We're going to give you up to 10%. And we're going to give you higher yield than anybody else will. So don't ask us for a collateral. We'll, we'll give it to you on the front end or the back end. They say, great. So now what does that mean? If you're a Voyager, a Celsius, whoever else it is, you always say, I'm going to pass that on to my customers. So I'm going to give them an 8% yield on whatever stable coin or crypto they want to do. I'm going to pocket the 1%. And I'll take the other 1% or I'll give it back to three arrows capital, or maybe I'll do a split of eight and two. It doesn't really matter because it all depends on what they were told. So when I see these things, I get it. But the one thing that does not escape me is this last sentence right here, where it says quite clearly, some lenders didn't ask for audited financial statements or any documents at all. Is that saying that they all didn't do it? Maybe, maybe not. But I can tell you right now, these types of audits and these types of paperwork, it can all be manipulated for the, where someone could say, oh, you actually do have that on file or you do have that in the bank. We trust you, here's your loan. So. I'm not here to make excuses for anybody. I'm just kind of saying I can see what happened. <clears throat> the trouble. Seems to have started in earnest last year. Three hours huge bet on Grayscale Bitcoin was the numb of it. The firm reaped the rewards when there was a premium. It felt the pain when GBTC began trading at a discount. As more people piled on the trade and new alternatives emerged, the premium disappeared, then went negative. All arbitrage dies after a point. Davies was aware of the risk this pose of three arrows. And on a September 2020 episode of a podcast called Castle Island, he admitted he expected the trade would fade. 
But before the show aired, Davies requested that the segment be edited out and the firm obliged. That's fine. You can do what you want to do. If someone says, I don't want to have that in there, you take it out. I've done that before myself. Three Arrows GBDC shares were locked up for six months at a time, but Zoo and Davies had a window to get out sometime that fall, and they still didn't do it. They had Apple opportunity to get out with a graze, but not blow themselves up, and they got too ahead of themselves and too much pride, and they didn't take it out, and that's a big part of why they collapsed on top of some other things, which we'll get into right now. Colleagues now say Three Arrows hung in its GBDC position because it was betting the SEC would approve the conversion of a spot ETF, and that didn't happen. Crypto enjoyed a bull run the last end of April with Bitcoin hitting a record above 60,000, and Dogecoin started as a joke. It went up because of uh, pretty much Elon Musk. Report puts Three AC's assets at some $10 billion at the time. So even though all those things are going to grayscale Bitcoin, they were still up. Three AC's assets at $10 billion. However, this was citing Nansen. And Nansen's CEO now clarifies that much of the sum was likely borrowed. So even though they had $10 billion on paper, it was from everywhere else where people were giving them money. In retrospect, Three Arrows seemed to have suffered a fatal loss later that summer. In August, two of the fund's minority partners who were based in Hong Kong and worked between 80 and 100 hours, they quit or they retired. And around that time, there were signs that Three Arrows was hitting a cash crunch when ledgers, lenders asked for collateral it often came back pledging its equity in Dairybit, which is an exchange or a company where they had a bunch of funds into it. And they said, oh, no, we'll just give you shares of, of Dairybit, and that'll be our collateral. However, illiquid assets, like a company, aren't ideal collateral, but there's another snag. Three Arrows owned the Dairybit stake with other investors who refused to sign off on using their shares as collateral. 3AC apparently was attempting to pledge assets it didn't have the rights to. So what happened here? So again, I think it was people were asking for the collateral. They said, well, let, here are our shares of Dairybit. And somebody in the company didn't do due diligence and go back and say, well, it's not just you that owns these shares of Dairybit. We need documentation that the other shareholders are okay with you giving up all these different shares because you don't own all of those shares. So let's go back, give us that paperwork, and then we'll do a business. It's tough to push back, but if you don't do it, things like this will happen. So it's important that everything that you see from now on, make sure you push back a little bit. So move on. The firm seems to have promised the same chunk of locked up GBTC to server, several lenders. We suspect that Three Arrows attempted to pledge some pieces of collateral to many people at once. Sam, uh, Sam Bakeman free to see of FTX. In February, Three Arrows took its big swing. It put 200 million into Luna. Then in early May, Luna collapsed to zero, wiping out more than 40 billion in a matter of days. And this is what's crazy. Three arrows holding a Luna, once roughly half a billion dollars, was suddenly worth 604 bucks. Imagine going from $500 million to about 600 bucks in a matter of, oh, days, hours to days. Scott O'Dell, leading executive at Blockchain, reached out the firm to check in about the size of Luna hit. After all, the Luna agreement stipulated that Three Arrows notify the company if it experienced an overall drawdown of at least 4%. And uh, Three AOC said, was not that big as part of a portfolio holdings anyway. We didn't hold that much, but they did. They lied. A few hours later, Odell informed Zhao that it would need to call back a significant portion of its quarter of a million, quarter of a billion dollar loan and would take payment in dollars or stable coins, whichever they want to do. And Zhao said, uh, I don't really can't do that. And he says, yo, um, something like that. And a few days later, Davis threatened to boycott blockchain. Once that happened, we knew something was wrong. Zoo and Davies used the whole regular pitch meetings on Zoom, but they just let that go. Zoo and Davies played it cool as they called up seemingly every wealthy crypto investor they knew, asking to borrow large quantities of Bitcoin, offering the same hefty interest rates the firms always had. They were clearly pumping their prowess as a crypto hedge fund after they already knew they were in trouble. Three Arrows was scrounging for funds just to pay its lenders back. Davies told Charles McGrath, Chief Strategy Officer of Blockchain, they was trying to get a 5,000 Bitcoin loan, then worth 125 million from Genesis to give to yet another lender to avoid liquidating its positions, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And also just remember this, there was also another lender a centralized exchange called Celsius. And Celsius was also in that, in that little pot at the, around that time. 
Uh, when the court filings came in, this, this was on July 21st, it was revealed that uh, Celsius had uh, given $75 million to Three Arrows Capital. And it's just one of those other places where we talk about contagion. Uh, Genesis Global issued $2.36 billion in loans to Three Arrows Capital. Uh, and then who knows if they're ever going to get that back. So again, how much is this going to affect? Time will only tell. Three O's position was so large that effectively began to tank the broader markets, all the scrambling to sell and meet margin calls by 3AC, panicky investors, push prices down, clients that have further declines, and away it goes, a big cascading effect. Crypto, par crypto markets went from $3 trillion to under a trillion in a matter of months. In Three O's final days, the partners reached out to every wealthy crypto whale they knew to borrow more Bitcoin, the top crypto executives and investors from the US to the Caribbean to Europe. They believe 3OC found willing lenders of last resort among organized crime figures, owing such characters large sum of monies could explain why Zoo and Davies have gone into hiding. After the collapse, execs at crypto exchange began comparing notes. They were surprised to learn that 3Os had no short positions, which had stopped hedging, which is the same that they did before. The very thing it had maintained was the cornerstone of its strategy. Investors and exchange executives now estimate that by the end, 3AC was leveraged around three times its assets, but some suspect it could be magnitudes more. So 3 O's kept all the money in commingled accounts, taking from every pot to pay back lenders. That meant that 3AC ignored margin calls and ghosted lenders in mid-June, including FTX and Genesis, liquidated their accounts, not realizing they were also... So FTX and Genesis liquidated their accounts, not realizing they were also selling assets that belonged to 3AC's partners and clients, which I can see is why everything was just going round in a big circle. The Voyagers, the Celsius, the, all the different places, Eight Blocks Capital, they were all lending and liquidating and lending and liquidating. 3 Arrows Capital filed for Chapter 15 bankruptcy. That's the process for foreign companies on July 1st. Uh, as creditors rushed to file their claims, 3OC's founders had already beaten them to it. The first person in line was Zhu, who on June 26th filed a claim for $5 million. Davy's wife, Kelly Kylie Chen, claimed she had lent the fund close to $66 million, but the only documentation they had to back up their claims were simple, self-attested statements that did not specify when the loans had been made or the purpose of the funds. And to finish up, the authorities are also taking a closer look at 3 arrows. Monetary Authority of Singapore, the country's equivalent of the SEC is investigating whether 3AC, which is already reprimanded for providing false or misleading information, committed further breaches of its regulations in the US, the SEC. Attorneys are now being copied on all three arrows court filings. So that's it in a nutshell. And that was a little bit long, but you have to understand as time goes on, people are just going to say 3AC. And no one's going to have any context to it. They're not going to talk too much about it or what exactly went on. I just want people to remember that just because somebody made a call right one time or just because there is a certain amount of clout doesn't mean anything. You have to look behind the story. You have to look behind the person, behind the company and really do the digging that you should, should be doing this whole time. And it's why we have these rules up, which you can find right here. Very simple. The rules are five and they work for me. You can modify them any, any, any way you want to. But for me, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Just assume it's all gone. And if you do that, you won't feel so heavy. If you have to make a decision of, of spending $20 on, a, on an investment and think, well, that's all gone, probably not a big deal. But if you say, maybe I should sell my house, my wife, and my kidneys to buy more of this asset, and you realize it could be all gone, maybe it's a sign not to do it. Also believe that everything's a scam. Everything's a scam until proven otherwise. Tr you have to verify, don't trust. Don't leave anything on exchanges. Everything should come off into cold storage as fast as possible. Don't use leverage like these guys. The fastest way to ruination, there's three L's. There's ladies, liquor, and leverage if you're a guy. And mostly it just comes down to leverage. Don't 25 or 50X. It's a recipe for disaster. And the last one is take profits. Nobody ever went broke taking profits. That's what it all comes down to. So look, that was a bit long. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, maybe in a couple of years, someone will see this and go, okay, that's exactly what happened. And I see the same thing that happened before is happening today in 2025 or 2029 or 2034. Anyhow, thanks so much for watching. I do appreciate it. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. That's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one.